Welcome to Possibility Project. Um, we're a growing community of disruptive change makers reclaiming our power through meaningful sparks, connections, and action. And I want to just point out that if you are new to this community and new to Possibility Project, you can catch all of our previous episodes on the website. If you go to www.possibilityproject.org, and Devin will put that in the chat as well, you can watch any of the past um, events that we've had. And after every single event, we post the recording and we post all of the resources that are shared by our brilliant panelists. And, and in the chat as well. So if you have articles that you love, um, books that people should read, videos that people should watch, please feel free to add that to the chat. And what Devin and I do is after each episode, we pull through the chat and we ask our speakers to share awesome resources and we put all of those together in not only a follow-up email, but also on the website. So check it out and please share. So we use, um, let me go back. We use introduction guidelines to introduce ourselves that are from the Genesis Healing Institute. So I'm gonna advance so you can see who Devin and I, who we are. Um, so Devin is sharing the, the Genesis Healing Institute Zoom guidelines that we are using, but um, you are welcome to use it as well. You have full access to it. Nova Run has offered that anyone can use this to lead off their meetings and get their activities started. So I'll start with introducing myself. My name is Heather Hiscox and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm coming to you from the land that was kept and held sacred by the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki people. I honor these ancestral keepers of the land where I am now living and honor their descendants who continue to breathe sacred life into our earth. And Devin and I recognize that with territory acknowledgements, it's just one really small way that we are focused on disrupting, dismantling colonial structures. And if you want to learn more about the land that you occupy or more about this topic, um, Devin's going to put in the chat, there's a website you can check out. There's a number that you can text and it will show you the land. It'll text you back that you occupy. So you can start to use that in some of your acknowledgement work. And so um, for anyone that's joining that is differently abled, um, might be visually impaired. I want to describe myself. So I'm a white woman with uh, freckled skin, blue eyes, red hair, and wearing a black and white shirt. I'm in a blue room with colorful art behind me. Um, and we will produce a transcript using Otter, a very detailed transcript of all of the words that are spoken today. And that will also be shared as a resource if you would like to have that form of the conversation today. And I want to introduce my amazing co-creator, Devin Davey. So Devin is a strategy consultant who helps female social entrepreneurs and networks by co-designing and implementing projects and collaborations centered on people and process. So Devin's gonna share her uh, website if you wanna learn more about her work. And as I said, I'm Heather Hiscox. I'm the CEO and founder of Pause for Change. And I work with nonprofits, local governments and philanthropy to help them address challenges and pursue opportunities um, in more efficient, efficient, effective ways. So my website is pauseforchange.com and Devin will share that as well. So Devin and I started this project when COVID first hit, we were having these conversations with folks in our network. And these were the conversations that we joke were the ones that you kind of had in like dark corners where you had to look around a little bit to see who was there. Because we were talking about more of these disruptive topics that we felt like the sector was really needing to acknowledge and work on. And when COVID hit, we we're like, it's time. Like we're seeing these new conversations, this flexibility, this change emerging. So we wanted to be a part of, you know, transforming the sector to be better than normal. And these are the four goals that we have for Possibility Project. So uniting our community of change makers, that group that's in LinkedIn, the thousands that have attended and joined. We want you all to, to join together and, and make some connections and we'll provide space and time for that today. Stimulate new thinking and a thirst for change. Explore collaboratively what could be possible. We really are focusing on action orientation this season and examining our role in transformation. We recognize early in this work that it starts with ourselves and then we can start to expand to our teams and our organizations and as a sector. So we wanna call that out. And I wanna go back to a slide that I had previously. Um, this is all a volunteer. Our amazing speakers are all volunteer. Devin and I, this is a volunteer initiative and effort. So we have started fundraising um, through opencollective.com slash possibility project. That's our fiscal sponsorship. So there's many different ways that you can support 
making a small gift of thanks and support, uh, recurring monthly gifts. You can sponsor a speaker, you can sponsor an episode. And these are some of the amazing donors that we have, um, we want to acknowledge so far that we've helped raise um, some funds. So we'll remind you about this if you are able to and you have capacity to share some support. We would love it um, if you could make a small gift at the end of the episode or when we send our resource information to help keep the work going. So thank you so much to our donors. We appreciate any support. Um, so what I want to focus on now is just what we're going to do together today, the agenda. So we first are going to um, introduce our guests and you're going to meet up here. You're going to introduce yourself to someone else that's here on this call, get to know someone. We're going to have our short lightning talks that are about dysfunction related to this topic. Our guests are going to chat about what's giving them hope. We always ask the same two questions every single episode. What's just dis the dysfunction you want to disappear? And what's emerging that gives you hope? That's always what we focus on. There will be a chance for you to ask questions of our speakers. So keep that chat going the whole time. And then we will go to breakout rooms where you can talk with other people that are on this chat today to discuss how, what you're thinking, how you're feeling about these topics and, and what you wanna learn more. And then we're gonna have our guests come back and give us some takeaways. And we're gonna talk about our next episode. So that's what is to come. So I'm going to stop sharing now because we are done with the slide piece. Um, just to give you a little bit of context of where this topic came from, um, I had a conversation with a recruiter, uh, a white male recruiter, and we were um, talking about his work and he was saying he's getting very specific requests of people that organizations want to hire. And the example that he provided was organizations will say, you know, I want a black female CFO very specific. And he says, you know, I did that person just does not exist. I there might be three women that fit that description in the country. And I thought, really? What? And I started thinking of people in my network that would absolutely know amazing, phenomenal female leaders that fit that description. And it just got me thinking about white networks and about this whole idea of not having a talent pool to draw from, of you know what diversity means in that conversation. So we wanted to really bring this to light, and that's why we want to invite our amazing speakers. So um, I want to get started in talking to our speakers. And before we jump in, um, when Devin and I were thinking about this topic, and when we named it, we we're talking about the talent pipeline. And Devin did a great job. When we were having conversation this week, bring up this, the word of pipeline is problematic, especially to indigenous communities. And so we are going to rename this um, topic, this, this episode we're gonna have today. So any of the advertising you saw before, we're gonna change what the card looks like and what we're putting on the website. And we were talking to our speakers and we were talking about alternative words such as, you know, talent pool, talent funnel. So in the chat, I would love any feedback about ways that you talk about alternatives to talking about a talent pipeline, because it's something that we want to honor, we want to rename. So we wanted to just call that out and, and bring that up. And we love your, your comments. Um, and so with, with our guests, we are a little bit different in how we do our introductions. Um, we have amazing speakers with the most impressive bios, which you saw in all the reminder emails that we sent and Devin's pasting them in the chat. Um, but we'd like for them to start by telling us a little interesting story, something about them that helps us get to know them and get to just get a taste of what they're like and, and a little bit of fun to get us started. So I'm going to introduce them just with their basic title, and then they're each going to share a little uh, story, a little something about themselves. So the first person I'm introduce is Mary Morton. Mary is the president at Morton Group, and Mary's going to share about a travel challenge she experienced that she's still trying to live down. So Mary, take it away. Great. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Morton, and uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm here in Chicago where it is 80 degrees today. So it's very exciting. Um, so my travel story is, um, you know, busy consultant traveling back and forth often when we could travel, might be in more than one or two cities, maybe even three cities in one week. And um, I was on my way to the airport um, to go to North Carolina. Uh, and, and in Chicago, you can't take a direct flight to North Carolina, you have to go through South Carolina. Uh, 
I'm sorry, it's just a reverse. I was on my way to South Carolina and I was going to North Carolina first to make the connecting flight. And so um, I was meeting a, a friend there. Uh, we were doing a, a presentation um, and she, she got to um, the airport before I did. She landed before I did. So as I'm coming off the plane, uh, I'm texting her saying, I'm here, I'm gonna meet you in baggage claim. And she said, okay. And so I get down a baggage claim. I said, you know, I don't see you anywhere. And she said, well, I'm right here by the car rental. I said, you know what? My bag isn't here, which of course was enormously frustrating. I said, I'm gonna have to go to that area where you go for, you know, lost luggage. And so I'm, I'm still looking, trying to find my friend. Um, and as I'm standing in front of the desk, I still have her on the phone and I'm, you know, somewhat indignant about the fact that my luggage has not shown up. I said, I just can't believe that my luggage isn't here. And, and oh, this is really going to be problematic. And so my friend is still saying to me, you know, I, I don't see you. Where are you? I said, I am now in the area. You probably can't see me because I'm in the area where I need to get my luggage. And um, the woman says, can I see your ticket behind the desk? She says, may I see your ticket? She takes my ticket and she says, so, um, you know, you're supposed to be on another flight. You're in North Carolina and you're going to South Carolina and in about five, four, three, two, you've just missed your flight. So I never made the connecting flight. For some reason, I got off the plane, went immediately to baggage claim. Um, and of course was in the wrong state, not just the wrong city. I was in the wrong state. In the meantime, my friend, I can, I can barely keep the phone up to my ear because she is just about falling on the floor laughing. People are walking around her trying to figure out why is this woman laughing like this. Um, I had to wait for another flight. She had to come back and get me. And she continues to talk about, and this happened a couple of years ago. And she continues to tell, in fact, she just told it last week. We were in a group of folks. Um, we hadn't been able to gather in a while and she told this story. So that gives you some sense of, um, yeah, just a very, very embarrassing time. Um, and I haven't, I've yet to live it down. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing that. I think we've all had those humbling moments when we're like, no, where's my luggage? <laughs> what is happening? And then we're like, oh, oh yeah. I, I have done something. <laughs> exactly. well, thank you for sharing that moment of vulnerability. <laughs> so next I want to introduce Rachel Ranj. Ramjatan. Um, she's an author, speaker, master trainer, and fundraising coach. And Rachel's going to share a bit about how she grew up and her first introduction to fundraising. So Rachel, take it away. Oh, thank you, Heather. And thank you for having me. I'm just so honored to be among this wonderful group of do-gooders. So I was born and raised in Jamaica. And I grew up in the suburbs of Kingston in the mountainous area that was a mixed income community. And I always say it's the greatest gift my parents ever gave me because from a very young age, my brother and I learned that life isn't fair. Uh, many of the opportunities we had, our friends didn't have simply because their parents you know, weren't as educated, you know, didn't earn as much. And so it was a real community because everybody shared what they had, but we were very mindful of the unfairness of life. My parents are very involved in charity work. And so um, at one point, my dad uh, was the president of the Lions Club. And so for about eight weeks every year, they would uh, raffle a Mercedes Benz to raise money to pay for vision operations for people suffering blindness. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was about 12 years old and we were a competitive bunch, you know, so we would fan out in the busiest shopping district to sell tickets. And quite often I emerged the winner a portent of things to come, I think, in terms of my fundraising career. But this Saturday, a beggar set up shop right on my corner. And I wasn't impressed because he put a serious dent in my business. <laughs> uh, you know, instead of people buying raffle tickets, they were giving him money. And so at the end of the day, my dad came to get me and he said, it's time to go now. And I looked at the beggar and I said, would you like to make a gift to the blind? And my dad says, how can you beg a beggar? What's wrong with you? Let's go. And he was horrified. And to our surprise, the beggar dropped a few coins into the camp. And I would say that was the moment I fell in love with fundraising because I learned a valuable lesson that day, which is that every single human being wants to make a difference in the world in whatever way they can. And you don't have to have a lot of money to do it. The question is how many of us are invited to the table? And so that's kind of how I fell in love with the profession and particularly my focus now, which is working as a, an immigrant and ally to help 
um, BIPOC leaders grow their fundraising prowess so they can represent uh, or get visibility in the sector and rightfully take their place as leaders because right now our sector is not diverse enough. So that's my story. Mm, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. And last but not least, Dr. Arhelis Ortiz. Arhelis is a professor, executive coach, founder, principal consultant, and is really focused on helping leaders of color seek upward mobility in their social services careers. So Arhelis, you have an interesting story about your own name and your company name. Will you share that with us? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Heather and Devon, for, for bringing us uh, together today. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I see a lot of great names out here and, and I'm probably not the only one sharing this experience, but when I grew up, I was born and raised here in uh, a neighborhood in, in uh, Los Angeles called Boyle Heights. And it's a fairly uh, predominant uh, immigrant community, uh, Spanish speaking. And my mom gave me a name from some soap opera person and character and the nurse kind of misspelled it and they kept it. They were like, oh, that sounds about right. And they just kind of kept it. And so my name was supposed to be Angelis, A N. G L I S, and then somehow it got converted to Argelis or Argelis, and they kind of kept it. <clears throat> so for, for many, many, many years, I, you know, people butchered my name or call me Angel. I see Angel, give me some love there. Um, it just called me everything under the sun, but Argelis. And somehow or another, the, the, the name or the, the word Silegra came in, which is my name backwards, right? So it's my first name backwards. And then people could say that all the time. It just rolled off people's tongues. There was nothing about it. And I was like, how can you say the backwards, which is incorrect, but you cannot say it what I thought was the correct way. Um, so anyways, that happened all my life um, until I got my doctorate and then Dr. Ortiz is what I go with because it's easier to kind of not correct people and not, right? Um, but yes, uh, I appreciate the, the sentiment of being here, but uh, yeah, I could imagine a lot of names that are on this call get that similar uh, uh, mispronunciation, you know? Yeah. But thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Absolutely, people can relate to that. We now want to hear from our amazing speakers. So as I said, we always ask the same two questions. So with our first question, related to the talent pool um, and this idea that there just aren't you know, leaders of color that people can find to put in amazing positions, what dysfunctions about that do we want to disappear from the sector? So I'm going to start with Mary, and I would love to hear your thoughts about that. Sure. And yes, it was lovely to have that meet and greet. So that's a, that's, that's a very nice thing that you do. Um, so I would say uh, the one thing that I would love to disrupt um, with regard to this topic is the, I, the dynamic and the practice around um, really concentrating on culture fit in an organization. Um, Morton Group does executive searches uh, around the country and I can't tell you the number of times I've been in a room where someone has said, oh, I'm just not sure that they're gonna fit with everyone else. And what we know about culture fit and the, and the use of that term is that it's a way to really exclude, um, that it's used often as a way to disclude BIPOC um, uh, folks. And it really is a way that further perpetuates implicit bias. So, here are a few examples of that. Um, when you think about uh, whether, and this is really, this re is regarding placement in an organization, whether it's a nonprofit or pro for profit, it also applies to boards of directors. Um, we often hear the same thing when we will ask a board of director, um, an organization where they don't have, a, you know, um, diverse members of, of the board, they only have, you know, they're, it, it's a white, basically a white organization, although they serve people of color, and we'll ask well, you know, what have you done? What's your outreach look like? And when we ask, how did you get to the organization? And again, this happens on boards or in, in staff positions, they will say, I knew someone. I knew someone. And that is what happens. We tend to gravitate. And this is, this is just how we're socialized, right? We, we tend to gravitate toward people that look like us and or that we believe share similar experiences. And uh, when I ask a board member, how did they get to the board? They'll say, well, so-and-so recruited me. And so-and-so, by the way, looks just like the person I'm speaking with. Uh, similarly, in, in, the, um, in the staffing area, when we're talking about um, um, you know, where, you, where are you looking for your candidates? And they will say, well, I put it on Indeed and I 
did X, Y, you know, I put it here and I said, well, so that's a very traditional way of looking for a candidate. And so what you really wanna do is think outside of, of uh, what would be a traditional uh, search because there are in fact many, many qualified people of color available and waiting um, and seeking um, particular kinds of roles. However, there are not as many of us. So when someone tells us we need to do the search and we needed that person four weeks ago, we often will say, we're not the person to work with you. Because while they're saying they wanted it four weeks ago, they're also saying, by the way, we really need, we really need a person of color. Those two things don't match up. Um, it will absolutely take longer to find a person of color. Again, not because the candidates are not there, but because they're just not as many of us. So it's going to take longer. Um, and so when we get into the interview stage, sometimes people will say, well, you know, when the executive team interviews someone, we just let them ask whatever they like. We don't give them set questions. And that's a big ding. Everyone should be asked the same questions. If not, it is very easy. And often what happens is there's implicit bias that is just waiting to pop out. Um, and if you decide to have a conversation with someone about, um, you know, what you did over the weekend, but you don't have that same conversation with the other candidate, so you don't get a chance to see them in that particular manner. You don't get a chance to, to really have an experience of them outside of the general Q&A of an interview. And what we know is that uh, when people say culture fit, people with hiring power really mean who I personally like or who reminds me of me. That's who they're referring to. So culture fit really relies on this, uh, what I would say is similar to a chemistry game that doesn't really reflect real life aptitude. And so because we do um, diversity and racial equity and inclusion work, it is very easy for us to see immediately um, where there may be implicit bias and where we would suggest having a conversation, maybe offline with the CEO, whoever's gonna make the final decision. Because sometimes when you're doing a C-suite search, it may not be the, the president or CEO search. There's a, you know, there's a team of folks and maybe the executive team that's interviewing a candidate. And on many occasions I've, I've had um, the, the interviewing team say, well, I just don't know if they're a good fit. So we've had to take that conversation offline and talk to the CEO about what this is really saying about his team. Uh, in this particular case, I'm thinking of a particular example, and to give them an opportunity to really put into play all the things we've been talking about, how you build more diverse, equitable, and inclusive organizations, because this is not, this is not the way to do it, not by focusing on, on culture fit. Um, one of the things that, um, this, there's an, uh, a test that's been used over the years, it's called the airplane test, and something that happens in an interview, someone may say, well, who would I, who would I like to spend uh, time with? If I had to, be, you know, if I was stuck in an airport with someone during a snowstorm, who would that be? And you might think, well, this person, I really like this person. So, so that person is probably gonna be a good fit for us here. That's not necessarily the case. And what we know is that in most cases, when, when, when a company prioritizes how a person fits into their pre-existing culture, it maintains the status quo. So we know that the status quo, right? Generation after generation, um, have really given advantages to white workers. And so the status quo still over selects white men in many cases. And so that is a dynamic that I would love for us to, to really interrupt. Um, I think it's tied to all the issues around building equitable organizations. And um, it's something that I, I talk about each and every time we do a search. Thank you. Such good points. So many good elements that people must consider. This idea of fit, mm -hmm. like fit who to whose norms exactly. Whose exactly. Whose exactly. Image. exactly. Oh, thank you. All right, Rachel. We want to hear about your thoughts. Like, what dysfunctions do you want to have disappear from the sector? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, there are really two. Uh, the first is that um, capacity building or leadership development, especially in the nonprofit sector, tends to be led by foundations that provide funding for that. And it can be a little bit dicey in terms of a one size fits all approach in that um, certainly the way I learned fundraising coming as an immigrant that grew up in a predominantly black country, uh, 
there was a totally different ball game here. Um, in America, the, the way they teach you is tends to be based on the experience of the white community. So for example, the initial contact with the donor is a gift and then you build a relationship with that donor. Whereas uh, where I come from and in communities of color, there has to be that relationship of trust first before you can ask for money. And so I think one of the challenges we have in the pool is that there's a lack of culturally relevant capacity building training for BIPOC leaders in a, that recognizes the history, the trauma, et cetera. And then the second piece of it is that um, organizations led by people of color have, I think it's 18 cents on the dollar of net unrestricted assets of those that don't. And when there is money that is given, it's given with more strings attached. And so there's chronic underinvestment in these grassroots organizations and leadership training simply because there's a lack of funding. So that's the second thing I'd like to see change. I would like to see BIPOC led organizations get more funding so they can invest in the personal development of their people in the kinds of training that they feel would be helpful to them. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so important, the investment. If you, there's so many reports that have been coming out and really showing the true, the true impact of the lack of support and organizations led by people of color and what that looks like. I mean, there's no denying it, right? The data is there, absolutely. Okay, hey, so Dr. Ortiz, we wanna hear from you, um, from your experience and your awesome work. What do you wanna see disappear from the sector? I think that this appears going to take a while, but the, the two thoughts I have are, um, for sure, I think it has to go back way, way, way back, even we, before we think about careers in general. I think we have to talk about our, our family systems, and we talk, have to talk about our expectations we have in our children, uh, speaking from a, a parent or a father, but also what cultural sort of expectations we have for for our next generation, right? I, I go back to when I was growing up, um, maybe a lot of you, right? But there was only three careers you could do. It could be a doctor, a lawyer and police person, right? Or doctor, lawyer, fireman, or doctor, lawyer and teacher, right? There's so there was only a combination of these three roles and everything was geared toward those three careers. Uh, but we know that it's, it's way more expansive than that. But as a, a, a person of color, you're really not thinking that. You're really thinking like, I, I'm gonna uh, uh, really, really achieve the stars and be that doctor and really achieve everything and be that lawyer, although there's way many other opportunities to do and go out there. And there becomes a sort of pressure slash shame if you're not aiming towards that, right? If, if you're a kid and you're like, got your first D in science, that means automatically you're not gonna be the doctor. If, if you're uh, uh, applying for college and you go for a humanities type of major automatically that's not going to make you the lawyer right so there's a lot of shame and pressure we have within ourselves <clears throat> to be one of those three careers so if there is a way to kind of disrupt that as a family as a culture in in, in all cultures I'm not just saying uh, 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 immigrants or people of color but a lot of us put pressure in these three major careers that have to occur uh, so if that was a way to sort of you know, expand that. Uh, th there's a lot of careers out there like social work, like teachers, uh, therapists, et cetera, that exist that are awesome. Uh, um, but there's also a lot of roles out there that haven't been invented yet, right? There's a lot of roles out there that are yet to be uh, created. And, and my belief is that um, if there is a way to encourage our, our youth to be kind of uh, critical thinkers and sort of uh, ambassadors for creativity, et cetera, then the roles will come to them as opposed to us trying to fit the mold into three opportunities, three careers. Um, and then the last one I think, or the second thought is, is just having ourselves be honest with ourselves and, and take some risk of people who are uh, emerging or people who are uh, of color and are rising the ranks of, of a field, take that risk, take, take the next step, right? If, if you've been comfortable at the manager level, become the director. If you've been comfortable at the director level, go for a C-suite role. If you kind of know you have an expertise in something, apply for a board, right? Like, like we have to push ourselves because as I often say, uh, invitations are not given, right? You have to bust the door open and go in there sometimes so you could uh, uh, be noticed at, at times. So those are two train thoughts that as we're hearing uh, May, uh, Mary and Rachel talk that, that we gotta go back to how do we support our family and our youth and then also how do we risk and how do we take bigger risks for ourselves so that we can pave the way for others and, and we could be that, that role model that uh, 
that hasn't been uh, as amplified yet, but maybe we could be that. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Of yeah, we talked in our speaker chat about representation. Who, who do you see? Who do you see in the roles of leadership? And what does that mean that you can become? And in many ways, how does that reinforce how white folks see themselves, that they see who has leadership positions? It's, it's really interesting dynamics. So we want to make a shift and, and please comment in the chat anything that you want to see disappear, add, add to what they've shared. And we want to talk about what's emerging and giving each of you hope. So what, what do you focus on for the future that you think we can do differently? Like what individual actions can we take? What can we do as organizations, as leaders and emerging leaders? So Mary, I'm wondering if you jump back in and tell us what's giving you hope and what we can do better. Well, picking up on what you were just saying in terms of representation, um, something we often uh, talk about are possibility models, right? Who, who are we seeing that makes us understand we can do that as well? And so I, I think that's an important piece. Um, with regard to what makes me hopeful, I, you know, the work that we do um, with regard to racial equity, access, diversity, and inclusion really makes me hopeful because we don't do that work lightly. Um, it's, it's very personal. And we feel that that's how we are, we're trying to change the world. Um, in some ways, right? This, that's our bit. That's the small piece that we can do. And we get to weave it in every single thing we do from, from an operational standpoint. And we get to then work with other organizations and help them do the same. And because we're on that journey as well, right? We're all on a journey. It's, it's a process. It's, it's, it's ongoing. You're not going to arrive at a destination. So we're always learning and, and sharing those learnings with our, our, our client partners and other stakeholders. I am, I am hopeful that so many people are interested in doing this work. Um, we have you know, just had to really uh, increase our staff resources because um, we were on, we've been on a tra trajectory, I would say since 2016. However, uh, certainly in the aftermath of George Floyd being murdered, uh, people have a different understanding about race, about the threat of anti-blackness that runs through this country and um, are talking about it in a way that they've never talked about it before. COVID actually has helped lift that up, I think, because um, you know, we talk about the what social determinants of health and where people work and play and live. Those have always been very um, uh, different for folks of color. And I'm just happy to see that it was something more than a, a 24 hour news cycle, that we are still talking about the disparities that have been lifted up in a deeper fashion because of COVID and because of the racial reckoning that, that started uh, in, in a very different way. I mean, it started years ago, but in a very different way this past summer. Yeah, yeah. Arhelis or Rachel, please add, add what you would share. What giving, what's giving you hope? I think <clears throat> there's quite a bit of hope out there. For one thing, the funders of nonprofits, so a lot of foundations around the country are taking a look at their grant making practices through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they're really making strides or taking serious efforts to try and root out implicit bias and prioritize funding for BIPOC led organizations. And we see it in different ways. So for example, there's a registry uh, that has been started where if you are a BIPOC leader that has founded a nonprofit, they ask you to add your name to this registry of nonprofits and foundations are looking at this list so that they can reach out to nonprofits that they may not have encountered before that align with the sort of issues that they're working on. Second thing that gives me encouragement is that Typically, uh, whenever big moments like this happen in history, uh, the people who benefit tend to skew white. So the white consultants get the work. And so there's recognition of that as well. And another registry has been created um, that, and, and we're asking lots of people who are consultants of color, add your name to that registry so that those that are looking to hire consultants and wanting to give priority and don't have in their personal networks have a place to go where they can look outside their networks and get creative, like Mary said, in terms of how we search for talent. And then the third thing that's giving me hope is really more on an individual basis. Um, 
you have to assume that other people's networks don't look like yours. And Heather, when you said that to me, both of us have networks that are very inclusive. And I don't think I realized how much I took it for granted until you made that comment. And I thought, you know, people are always asking me, who do I know? But the, I'm sometimes reluctant to offer people up in a sense that, are you looking just to interview somebody of color so you can check the box to say we interviewed somebody of color? Or are you looking to hire somebody of color who maybe needs a little more support because they haven't had the exact experience that you need? I mean, coaching is so inexpensive. And, and so I have to make that judgment call. If I'm working with an organization that's truly interested in developing a leader of color, I will absolutely offer up my network for that opportunity. But if they're just looking to check a box and text, uh, waste people's time, I'm not going to do it. You know, and so with my work, um, what I've chosen to do is really partner with foundations around the country to provide fund development training um, to BIPOC leaders, particularly uh, in a culturally relevant context. And I recognize my privilege. Um, I can be that connector because I've had the immigrant, immigrant experience but I also have to recognize that the way I look, people assume I'm white. And so, you know, it's, I, I see my role as a bridge builder then to help people of color that learn to fundraise the same way I did and had a lot of the same experiences I did learn that you're not asking people for money. You're freaking giving people the opportunity to change the world. It's a privilege for them to work with you, not the other way around, right? And so when we can get that mindset shift and, and reduce the trauma and help people get into the frame of mind of, you know, being in the power position to make the ask, I think that's a game changer for everybody. And with that comes recognition that um, people of color have trauma, they resist, they experience prejudice at a far greater rate than the rest of us do. So that's my little contribution to the world is I, I feel it this way, you, um, I want to help nurture a pool of talent, of fundraisers of talent that can take leadership positions because they don't need to go to people like me. People are, the people in leadership positions need to reflect the communities we serve. And I wanna make it so difficult for somebody to say, we, could only, we couldn't find anybody to recommend, <laughs> you know, because there are just not that many of us. There's plenty of us. So find the people who are passionate help them uh, do pursue their dreams. And that's the way we're gonna change the sector, one person at a time, you know, lifting up opportunities when we can. I love that, I love that. Arhalis? Thank you, Rachel and Mary. I, I, both of those brought great examples of sort of personal experience that I've gone through, but uh, sort of what brings me hope is that, um, I have two, two thoughts. One is uh, uh, as a professor, I'm seeing kind of the next wave of, of social workers or emerging human service professionals really question a lot of things, right? Well, why is it like this? Why are we still doing it this way? This looks antiquated. This is racist. I mean, they're really calling it out, um, which is great. And I think my role as a professor is at the moment, I'm trying to hold their sort of uh, questions, but be able to say, well, now what, right? Now, what do we do, right? Now that we know that it's in, in, I'm biased, now that we know it's still like this and it's still unfortunate, what can we do about it? And uh, I'll put a link up here about uh, a toolbox that we use sort of how to build community, how to build strategic planning. And, and it has a little bit of a, a, a sort of a BIPOC feel to it, but it's mainly about just the basics. I think we, we forget about building relationships is different when you're trying to be a, a direct service provider to when you're trying to fundraise to, right? But in the end, it's still building a relationship. So that that's kind of what builds um, provide some hope for me is that uh, as we get to meet a lot of you and maybe some of us hit it off more and there's a project we could work together. Or, uh, it really only takes two, three phone calls and now we're here, right? Like Heather and I had a phone call or a, a chat a few months ago and now Rachel and I are scheduled to have one next week, right? Like it's really about following through with that, right? And I think Devin and I might have another one later, right? But it, it just means about like putting yourself out there, like I mentioned earlier, but also following through with it. So mm -hmm. that's what gives me hope is as, as more people follow through, there's kind of more web of, of connections occurring. Um, and then lastly, I think uh, I echo Mary's thing that, that COVID has just kind of made it all come to light as, as a lot of things, right? Like what's really important? What's essential in your life? What are you really gonna do with your life, right? Do you really wanna go back to the nine to five? 
whatever that was, or do you want to make a bigger impact in the world? And, and that's really up to each of us. Um, do I got to go back to school? Do I not got to go back to school? Do I want to pursue this now that I've always wanted to do this? And it, it, whatever that is, right? So I feel those things kind of bring a lot of hope. Um, but just to piggyback on the kind of the, the, of the personal story is, and I see a little bit of the chat about, it, it, is, it also happens to us, right? It happened to me where I've gone to like really higher up roles about development, et cetera, but I checked a lot of boxes. And the one thing I didn't have was a lot of uh, um, asking experience, right? I, I had board experience, I had direct service experience, but I didn't have a lot of like how to ask for money. Uh, but it's definitely a teachable sort of uh, task or a, te a, a teachable um, something that they could train me on. And, and when I realized that they weren't hiring me because of that reason, at least that's what they told me, it was difficult to, to take or swallow because that's one of the things that you should be able to be trained on, right? That's one of the things that nobody gets taught how to do that automatically, right? You kind of get under the wing and you follow and you shadow, et cetera. So then I also realized, wow, it's still happening even quote unquote at my level, right? It's still happening even quote unquote at people who are um, successful and, and able to make it in, in uh, various ranks. So uh, yes, I think we're, we're all in this together, but also there's hope that people like Rachel and Mary and Heather and, and Devin are here to, to support this cause and support uh, the next wave of people. Yeah. Thank you. Mary, Rachel, do you wanna piggyback? On any of that, I, I definitely have a question, but I want to give you time for comments. Oh, uh, ditto, 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 Dr. Ortiz, absolutely. But Sadia asked a wonderful question in the chat that I want to raise up. You know, what she says, I'm curious what thoughts panelists have around what accountability on these approaches would look like. And especially, especially considering that a system manifests processes and behaviors and decision making that requires maintaining the status quo, what can accountability look like and how can it be implemented? You know, I, it's interesting you asked this question because uh, in my last employed role, uh, I was very involved in speaking truth to power and saying, look, uh, there are biases built into our processes. So I think the first thing would be uh, to kind of make a decision to see and, and raise the point, is this something we as an organization want to do? If it isn't, then guess what? Uh, I'm not sure I really want to be part of that organization, right? Uh, and if it isn't, then no matter what you do, you're never going to be able to push that boulder uphill by yourself. Uh, so that's the first thing, accountability yourself and making sure that you are working for or with organizations that align with your values. Uh, second, if there is a desire to, to make progress and to really take a critical look at things, how can we make sure that the people taking that critical look reflect all perspectives and that there is some commitment to what the outcome of that process looks like? Are there going to be recommendations that are made? If so, what is going to be the process for whether we adopt those recommendations or not? So I think that answers uh, that portion of the question. And there was one more question in the chat that I just wanted to comment on was, how do you know um, when, when to hire a person of color with the kind of supports they need? When is it too much? And you know, I respectfully will answer a different question that is gonna give you the answer to that question. Uh, for me, I always ha hire for passion for the mission. If somebody is passionate about the mission and you can teach them whatever they need to do to do the job. And people who are passionate about the mission tend to stick around much longer than those that don't. So for example, in my world, when I'm looking the average turnover for a development director is 18 months. That's insane. It's costing so much money. So if I'm doing the hiring, I would much rather hire somebody who is a person of color with passion for the mission that I can co-invest with. We can teach each other because surely there are things they can teach me and surely things I can teach them and there's coaching available. So I would say, look at it, not in terms of the cost of the support, but it's an accommodation you make to make sure you have a diverse workforce, just like it is that you have um, hearing apps for people who are hearing impaired or ramps at the front door to make sure people who are in wheelchairs can enter your building. And so if we flip the way we think about that, I think that's what's gonna drive real change. And I, I agree with everything you said, Rachel. And, and I would just add that um, I think sometimes it really comes down to people understanding the difference between equality and equity. Um, you know, for so many years, it was like, we just want to be equal. We all want to have the same thing. Well, you know, here's the headline. 
that I think many, many of us know is we didn't all start from the same place. So we're gonna need different uh, supports to be successful. And if you're really committed to equity, uh, so for instance, when we do an executive search, an example is we always put in that a new CEO or uh, uh, ED should be going to um, a, a, an ED or CEO bootcamp, for instance, and they should have an executive coach. Um, similarly, when you're an organization, and this happens a lot to people of color, um, someone will be promoted because they did well in that position. However, they're promoted and then they're given no supports at all. It's like, well, you got here. I hope you can maintain. And that really sets people up for failure, not for success. And so understanding equity and what it's going to mean in your organization is critically important. And um, really, what will you do to make sure that people have the access and the resources so that they can be successful? That's what equity looks like. So when we started a number of years ago and I made a commitment to hiring younger folks, that meant folks right out of college who, guess what? Nobody tells people how to show up actually at work <laughs> coming out of college. They often don't have the appropriate clothes to go maybe on a client call. So I, I bought those things for people because it was important for me for them to have those experiences. I really didn't want people to be um, thought about as just being a support staff person when there's so many other things they could offer. And the only way to do that is to show up in a particular way. And the last piece, I'll just say that some of the things that we're talking about, really, we have been socialized because of white supremacy culture, right? You know, we needed it last week, we needed it faster. And by the way, it needs to be perfect. And um, we've just got to call that out. We are all, we're all socialized that way. And we have to keep really peeling, peeling that back and pulling back from that. Um, it's a muscle that we have to learn how to flex, is what I would say. Uh, all great points. Well, I want to offer up in the chat any questions you have for the speakers, please put there. And as you're thinking about it, one of the things that really strikes me is, um, you know, one of our speakers that we're going to have on April 28th, uh, our topic is radical allyship is Fleur Larson. And she does a lot of work out of Seattle around diversity, equity, inclusion. And she talks about the preponderance of white, usually older women as gatekeepers in the sector. And that white older women are, you know, having their own harm and trauma of thinking about the sexism they had to overcome to reach their level in their career, but that there's some unrecognized bias and belief and, you know, ways that motivates behavior and action that aren't being called out and aren't being recognized across the sector. And so I'd be really curious um, how any of you have seen this show up, this gatekeeping role that can emerge, and especially this role. Of, of white women and white older women. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I'll just say that that absolutely is the case. And I think it sometimes people are, are surprised by that uh, and not understanding history. Um, you know, for instance, the fact that white women were completely happy to move forward without black women, or in some cases, even black men having the right to vote. I don't know if people understand that. Like that was not, we're not gonna be all one big happy family when, you know, that was not how that was presented. And that's not uh, what, um, some of the folks, you know, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Stanton, they didn't necessarily care about bringing black women with them. And some of that has continued so that people really talk about sexism, but they don't talk about racism. You know, it's, it's beyond even just being biased. It is just downright <laughs> racism. And, um, and people are so shocked often when you are talking to them about it, or what we talk about is not calling people out, but calling people in for conversation because we know that if we cannot have a conversation, we can't move the needle on these issues. So having people become defensive, which is the quickest way to shut down any work <laughs> in this area um, is, is not our goal. Our goal is to have a conversation. Um, our goal is to, to have people, um, people often talk about a safe space and we talk about yes, safe, but more importantly, brave. Because if you're safe, you can sit at your desk with your hands folded, not changing anything. Brave means I'm gonna ask some questions. I'm, I'm gonna be vulnerable um, and I'm gonna put myself out so that I can have a deeper experience. I can have a deeper learning here. So um, we see it a lot and we see it in a way that um, often white women don't, don't understand it or even acknowledge that it's happening because what they've been focused on is, is sexism and not racism. Heather, I was, I was counting kind of my past three or four roles, kind of C-level or VP-level roles, and they were all either uh, a referral or a hookup from a, a sort of a 
like you just mentioned, an ally who was a white woman. Um, I hadn't made that connection just yet, but um, very interesting. Very interesting that they are gatekeepers in many uh, uh, sectors, but particularly in nonprofits where I work at, there's uh, a lot of folks who uh, bring in good talent. And, and I go back to um, the only way, the only reason I met these women in particular is because I put myself out there to, you know, show that I could do it, to know that I was actually a, uh, play, play, uh, play the game, et cetera, et cetera. But then I also realized, wow, they had, they hold a lot of power, even if it's not the hiring power, but they hold a lot of influence on, you know, who should look my way, how should I be treated, et cetera. So yeah, I had to make that connection. Thank you for, for bringing that to light. There, there's a, there's a powerfulness in, in knowing your allies, but also, you know, having the transparency that is a, a relationship of, you know, who's, who's is this going to benefit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other question it brings up for me is this idea of belonging. And I'm curious how it shows up. You know, you, you have an amazing pool of candidates. Maybe a leader of color is chosen for like an executive position or a role within an agency. You know, Mary, you spoke to like, you've, you've kind of sussed out like what's really going on in this organization, but beyond executive coaching to prepare them for the work, is there, what can organizations do to have a culture of belonging where everyone, especially new hires and you know, folks of color that are taking on roles and all levels of diversity, right? If they're transgender or they're you know, different, differently abled, how can organizations create belonging? Well, I think one way is the onboarding process is extraordinarily important in all organizations for all levels. And it is important when someone is coming into an organization that, that they feel welcome. And, and that, may, that may sound really simple. Uh, however, I, can, I could, countless times I've heard from folks that said, when my first day when I showed up, um, you know, when we were working in actual offices, most of us, um, I didn't have a phone. Uh, my laptop or computer had not been set up. No one seemed to know what to do with me. Wow. That's how someone is coming into a place, into an organization. And let's also then compound that if they're an underrepresented person in that organization. So they, they're not starting off in a way that makes them feel included. And this idea about diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, diversity is, you know, all the many, many indicators, as you've mentioned, it's just not about race. It's just that race is the most obvious one. It's everything from sexual orientation to physical ability to economics. Um, inclusion is you invited me to this organization and am I gonna feel validated? Um, you know, similar, you know, I was invited to the party, is anybody gonna ask me to dance? And, and equity, or, or maybe dancing is not even appropriate for me, right? Because I, I have um, disability. And then equity is this idea, again, as I said, how do we meet people where they are to get them what they need to be successful? And so if that is not thought about in every level of an organization, when somebody is being onboarded, that person is not going to feel that, you know, they're included. And, and so, how people are introduced, how they're mentored. Mentoring is different than coaching, by the way. All, the, all of these inputs, if you will, really will lead to a successful outcome. And when we don't have them, this is why people will come into an organization and this idea of, of them trying to fit the culture. No, the culture has to be inclusive. That's what we should be trying to work on. If I could tag team on what Mary said. Um... I've also been in situations where you see a BIPOC leader become part of the team. The intention of the team is to become more inclusive. And yet the BIPOC leader themselves isn't aware of their own, aren't aware of their own implicit biases sometimes. So I think for me, we all have implicit biases. Me as an immigrant, me as a white person, me as a daughter, me as a mother. I mean, we're just loaded with them and we don't, unless you've studied yourself, uh, which a lot of people don't take the time to do, you're not aware of them. So for me, if I take a step back, part of making people feel welcome is creating shared experiences that can help each person uncover their own implicit bias and how that might be expressed in the workplace through the assumptions we make about people or the lens through which we see things, you know? And so I fully agree with you, Heather, that um, it's difficult when white women are the gatekeepers and many of them themselves have had not had those experiences. But I think those of us that are looking for jobs, when we start asking questions, you know, like, 
tell me, how do you invest in the personal development of your individual staff members, as well as team building for the whole group? That speaks volumes to how woke that organization is. To Are they really walking the walk or are they just talking the talk? And for me, before I'll work with an organization, I'm tired of beating my head against the wall. At this point, it's about figuring out what flank I can make a dent in and then go there. So even with every one of us has to ask that question, um, we have different roles to play. There are people like Vu Le, who are out there speaking truth in a way that is a provocative and absolutely truthful, not necessarily translating into reality in the sense that if we follow what he suggests, you know, your organization might become extinct by the time you make a transition. And so there need to be people like me who are working at a very practical level that say, look, the, the injustice is there, but we're, and just as Mary said, we're not going to make a dent by closing down the conversation and making people defensive. So the question is, how can we who are woke put ourselves in uncomfortable positions with people who need to be woke, find some common ground with them by meeting them where they're at, and then opening up that discussion and experience so it can be a heart experience? Because the problem is, I think the minds rule the heart, you know, and, and it is a difficult balance between the two, you know. Any other thoughts from our speakers? And Devin, if you have a question, um, definitely lift it up from the chat or any question you're thinking about, jump in. I, I just wanna add uh, that um, this idea that uh, Rachel just raised about our um, uh, BIPOC folks and internalized bias or internalized racism even, um, I think it's an important piece to raise um, because there's an assumption that when you put a person of color in a role, particularly when people are really thinking about optics, mm -hmm. that, that is really important to them, <laughs> that you don't do, an organization uh, may not do their due diligence around whether or not that person really does get it. Because there's an assumption because you're a person of color, you have that shared experience. You understand X, Y, and Z. And let me tell you, that is not the case. You know, Experiences are different across the board um, and everyone doesn't understand um, um, all of the various experiences that that let's just say black folks have had. So when I was and I've been the first or the only in many cases and and we're you know black folks are not monolithic. What a shock. And so please don't make me represent every black person you've ever, you know and every idea that's that's not particularly fair or, or appropriate. And so acknowledging that we have our own work to do around bias uh, and that we've taken in so much negativity um, that of course it's going to show up somewhere and we have to actively work against it as well. I definitely agree, Mary. I also think that that once we make it there to whatever there was or is, whatever ceiling we broke, uh, it's it's kind of romantic to kind of speak for everybody. Wow, I made it here. Now let me share what I've always wanted to share. But yes, it, it and it does take practice to kind of sit back and listen and be humble and say, you know what, I, this is what I experienced, but I, I was also a youth, you know, 20, 25, 30 years ago, right? I'm not a youth anymore, right? I also lived in that neighborhood but no longer, right? So, so it takes a lot of courage for one, to make it there, but also to acknowledge that, that even though I do represent sort of at the moment what I am, but I don't represent the current culture or what's happening. So let's go ask. I think that's, that's probably what my people or my staff um, often said is like, you always say, let's go ask. Well, yes, yeah, because I have the answers in my head about me, right? But I don't know about everybody else. So let's just go ask, right? We always forget that, that there's a piece about going to go get the current sort of status or the current uh, um, pulse out there as opposed to going back to my memory bank and saying, well, I wish this would have happened, right? Because, you know, totally different from my upbringing to what's happening now. I love that. That's such an important point. Devin, do you have any quick questions before we go to breakout rooms? Oh, we, there's so many awesome questions. Um, and I think we should move to the breakout room shortly. Um, maybe I'll just share a couple and if any resonate with you all or you wanna address them in the chat um, as we're moving forward. Uh, there's a question from Sadia and forgive my pronunciation if it's wrong um, or please correct me. 
um, sharing, curious what it looks like at, what this looks like at schools and companies that are um, majority BIPOC. So HCBUs, I'd imagine white supremacy and racism is less present because there's a larger context um, of white supremacy and I'd imagine it manifests in some potentially different ways. Um, and then uh, I think you all addressed some of the questions. There was one early on as well around, um, do you all have recommendations for equitable introductory prompts or questions for candidates um, tagging onto the onboarding question of helping people feel welcome? What does that actually look like tactically? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say, I'll, I'll start with the last one first in terms of uh, a prompt, something that, and this is this also has to do with then, has the person interviewed in a while? Because one thing that we can tell is when somebody has not been on an interview in a while, right? Because when you, one, you should rehearse, let me just say, you really need to rehearse if you're gonna be, you know, if you haven't interviewed in a while and maybe even if you have, um, to understand that having really clear examples as you talk about your work is very important and not just speaking in generalities. And so when we start with the question around, tell us why you are interested in this position at this time, that gives the um, candidate lots of room to talk about their work and themselves in a broad manner and to then bring it back to the role. And that is essentially what we're looking for. Um, and so really trying to have more open-ended questions so that people have some ability to um, to just talk more broadly about their, their experiences. However, you can't leave it there. I just want to say for those folks who are, you know, contemplating searches or going through searches, you must have clear examples of the accomplishments you've made. That is what is going to distinguish you from other candidates. And that's what generally interview teams are looking for. Um, and so asking a broad question that then can be narrowed is how we would suggest you you see the most of someone, if you will. Um, and we, you know, we will also ask questions about um, if, the, if the interview has felt uh, particularly heavy or serious, which they generally are, we want to see someone uh, in a lighthearted moment, similar to what we did here today, right? You have our resumes, you, you have our bios, telling a story about ourselves right, that um, certainly in my case was not particularly complimentary, uh, opens you up in a particular way right to the room and and so being able to acknowledge where you've had some lessons learned not failures but lessons learned <laughs> um is really really important as well when you're when you're leading with prompts and when you're responding to them um and asking those kinds of questions because it used to be and i don't know if you, you know when when i was coming out of college it was well when someone asks for your weaknesses you don't really tell them a weakness you tell them something that could really be construed as a good thing. So what, what people I think used to be coached in saying is, well, I'm a perfectionist because who wouldn't want a perfectionist? Well, actually that's part of white supremacy culture, big time. <laughs> and so um, there are you know, still many folks who won't recognize that or don't understand that. And that's what they all say. And what we try to coach our candidates on is you need to have an example of when something didn't go as as you planned and don't please don't say something like I'm a perfectionist or you know I I'm a workaholic and and yes you might be however right it's got to be something more than that and it, and it can't be one of those examples where well who wouldn't want someone who works hard who wouldn't want someone who's a perfectionist um, actually that does not serve you well as a leader and during this time, you know, if you're a leader that really manage, manages and leads more with your head than your heart, uh, then our suggestion is you try to flip that, particularly right now when people are frustrated, overwhelmed, have lots of mental health crises that we don't even know about if we're the leader in an organization. How are you checking in with your staff? Um, all those are really important. And it's important to be able to articulate how you've worked with your staff as well. So. I'm going back and forth as you know the folks who ask the questions and also how we coach the folks who are in the process and it's and it's important to think about the process in a, in a holistic manner okay speakers all right we're gonna move oh our headies do you want to make a quick mention yeah quick one um when we were doing more sort of uh, in-person interviews, I would try to set up opportunities to see 
the Canada in the wild, right? I would want to then how they treat the receptionist, how they treat the, the gardener who parked them by. I would purposely put a, a family who had like a rambunctious kid or a sibling set in the waiting room to see how they related to that. Because I needed to see them in their element at all times and not just when they were in front of me interviewing, right? I needed to see how they were going to react. Uh, and then I would gather info from everybody. Hey, you know, how did, how did that person greet you? Never looked at me. Signed the sign-in sheet, never looked up. That's right. right? Uh, what, how did they deal with that kid? It was kind of like kicking them in the back with a seat. Like, well, you know, she kind of stood up and smiled and walked away. So, so these are all great kind of uh, insights that are not going to come in in a sort of standardized questionnaire. So I, I like to put people in the wild as much as I can when I'm doing hiring, but also opportunities to whatever phase they're at in the interview process to put them in the room with the consumer, right? With somebody who's actually they're going to interact with either eventually on the day-to-day -day because that's going to give me some insight like you know I get to quote-unquote test if they really know the language if they say they're bilingual Spanish then I want them to, to interact that way if they say they know Tagalog then I want them to do that right so put, put them in the room with people that they're going to work with so so that I could see that sort of interaction uh, because ultimately right I'm going to give them the keys for the house or the car and they're going to start driving away and, and I won't be able to see them so I got to feel comfortable that they know how to do that so I got to put candidates in the wild as much as possible. That's that's my sort of insight if, if you guys want to do that. I love that. I love that. Such great advice. Thank you so much for sticking with us and being a part of the breakouts and meeting some folks. And thank you to our amazing speakers again. We we literally could not do this without you. You, you create such a beautiful um, just wisdom for this community that we can reflect on again and again. And many people do watch the videos again and again for inspiration and support. So thank you all for joining. And we hope that we'll see you on April 28th to talk about radical allyship. And Devin and I have a huge list of amazing topics to come. So we hope that you will keep accepting those emails and joining this community and let us know if there's anything we can do to help and connect and connect with everyone you have here. Thank you so much. Before we, go, before we go, I just want to thank you and Devin for your leadership in leading this brave conversation and inviting each of us to share our stories and inviting us to connect with each other in the breakout sessions. You know, these are the kinds of things that change. So I just want to lift you up and say I'm very proud to be a Possibility Project donor because I want to see more of these conversations coming. So thank you so much. Rachel, it's our honor. It's really our honor. Thank you. It is. Thank you so much for your support. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time. Have a beautiful rest of your week. Bye-bye.